gorgeous music. Thank you. Uh, President of the Federal Republic of Germany, Dr. Steinmeier, Mayor of Berlin, Minister for Culture and Media, Dr. Monika Grutas, Director of the Humboldt Forum, Professor Dagalo. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Actually, good morning-ish. It's almost afternoon. Thank you for having me here. When I was researching my second novel, Half of a Yellow Sun, which is set during the Nigerian Biafran War that started in 1967, a woman told me a story about her elderly father. It was early in the war, and they were in their Biafran hometown, feeling relatively safe because the war seemed far away. Then suddenly they heard the loud, terrifying sounds of bombing very close to them, and they knew that they had only minutes to leave their home and run into the interior for safety before the Nigerian soldiers arrived. The elderly father was a wealthy man, but the only thing he rushed to take with him was his ikenga, a piece of wood, a beautifully carved piece of wood, but it wasn't just a piece of wood. It was also the repository of spiritual meaning. The Ikenga represented his chi, his personal spirit, as well as his ancestors, his guardian angels. I was struck by this story. This man, facing the possibility of never seeing his home again, chose the thing that mattered most to him. Of course, he cared about his material possessions, but he believed that those could eventually be replaced, while his Ikenga was irreplaceable. There are Ikengas in various museums all over the world today, and it is easy to forget as we stare and admire them behind cold and clinical glass barriers that these are objects that are religious, spiritual, sacred. Art lives in history, and history lives in art. Much of what we call African art are also documents that tell stories. Some are literal in the storytelling, like the beautifully ornate Benin stool that was sent to the Oba of Benin by his people when he was exiled by the British, and which he looked at and immediately could deduce from the carvings the state of his British plundered land. Other sculptures and carvings are more metaphorical. They speak to the dignity of a people, to their worldview, to their aspirations. Some of the early Christian missionaries across the African continent were very keen on destroying African art carved African deities, which they told the Africans were just magic. I cannot help but wryly wonder what could be more magical than the story of a man who dies and then magically rises again, a man who also manages to magically give his body as bread. And I say this, by the way, as a newly returned Roman Catholic. The point is that Belief systems vary, and as long as they feed the spiritual needs of a people, they are valid. We cannot be dismissive of a belief system merely because it is unfamiliar to us, just as we cannot be dismissive of a history because we are uncomfortable with it. So I'd like to tell a small story about a Nigerian woman who's married to a Belgian and has lived in Belgium for many years. She said once that she was shocked that her son, while being taught Belgian history, was taught nothing about Congo. They teach my son in school that he must help the poor Africans, she said, but they don't teach him about what Belgium did in Congo. Now, if her son does not learn that the modern Congo state began 100 years ago as the personal property of a brutal Belgian king, who was desperate to get wealthy from ivory and rubber, 
If her son does not learn that the hands of Congolese people were chopped off with rusty axes for not producing enough resources to meet a cast, because we collectively acknowledge that it is so. It is not that Europe has denied its colonial history. That would be too crude. It is instead that Europe has developed a way of telling the story of its colonial history that ultimately seeks to erase that history. The former French Prime Minister Nicolas Sarkozy gave a now infamous speech in Senegal in which he said, I have not come to deny mistakes or crimes. Mistakes were made and crimes committed. But no one can ask of the generations of today to expiate this crime perpetrated by past generations. This is central to the story that Europe tells itself about its colonial history. It is a story that basically says, yes, colonialism happened, but. And whatever comes after the but is the focus of the story. What the focus on the but does is that it absolves. It frees Europe of responsibility of a significant and traceable connection to the African present, and it allows Europe the glow of charity. But the truth is that the past does not merely tell us what happened yesterday. It also illuminates what happens today. If we acknowledge that present day Europe is shaped by the Renaissance of 600 years ago, by the Enlightenment of 300 years ago, then surely we cannot say that what happened merely 100 years ago in Africa no longer matters. It matters. We are gathered today in this reconstructed palace, a beautiful place, but also a place that represents Germany's nostalgia for imperial times. When Kaiser William II lived here, German troops were killing children, women, and men in Southwest Africa. This building says that German history matters, even in a romanticized form. The history of Africa and Asia and Latin America must matter as well. We cannot pick and choose which histories and which points of view still matter, because to do this would be an ugly exercise of brute power. And speaking of power, here's a headline I just read in a German publication. The headline says, where do Africa's treasures belong? Now imagine this headline differently. Imagine if it said, where do Germany's treasures belong? It would be a redundant question because of course, Germany's treasures belong in Germany. But the question would never even be asked because there would be no circumstance in which it would be because of power. And so it seems to me that what we are fundamentally grappling with in this space, in all of these questions about the Humboldt Forum, is power. Unequal power, how we navigate unequal power relations. And there's always been to me something shabby about unequal power relations. The victory feels colorless, almost unearned.